Are you ready for a new direction in your life? Do you want to be free from the sins that drag you down? Well, if you said yes to either of these questions, then stay with us as our teacher, Dr. J. Vernon McGee, shares a solution to these problems. And while his ideas may not seem desirable at first, listen closely. It just may be the new direction that you've been looking for. And thanks for joining us on Through the Bible. I'm Steve Schwetz, your host on this five-year journey through God's entire Word. And today, we stop in 1 Peter chapter 4 at verse 1. So to begin our study, we got a poem that Dr. McGee shared many years ago, and it's really a great reminder for all of us to focus on what matters in life and not waste our time watching television or spending all of our time on our phones or social media or any of the other things that can so easily distract us from enjoying fellowship with God. The title of the poem is The Bible and the TV Guide. On the table, side by side, the Holy Bible and the TV guide. One is well worn, but cherished with pride. Not the Bible, but the TV guide. One is used daily to help folks decide. No, it isn't the Bible, it's the TV guide. As pages are turned, what shall they see? Oh, what does it matter? Turn on the TV. Then confusion reigns, they can't all agree on what they shall watch on the old TV. So they open the book in which they confide. No, not the Bible, it's the TV guide. The Word of God is seldom read, maybe a verse ere they fall into bed, exhausted and sleepy and tired as can be, not from reading the Bible, from watching TV. So then back to the table, side by side, is the Holy Bible and the TV Guide. No time for prayer, no time for the Word. The plan of salvation is seldom heard. Forgiveness of sin so full and free is found in the Bible, not on TV. To celebrate this great gift of salvation, here are just a few letters that we've received recently from you, our listening family on the Bible bus. The first one comes from Indonesia. I'm a single mother with three children. My husband left me for another woman, and I was filled with depression and despair. Then one day a friend invited me to listen to your program. I was so desperate for comfort that I tuned in immediately. To my surprise, I was overcome with the love I heard from your words, and I began to listen every day. Little by little, my heart changed, and I accepted Christ as my Savior instead of my husband. After this, I was surprised to feel that I could manage life on my own. To support my children, I got a job selling vegetables, and even though I was ridiculed by people in my village, I knew God would provide. And guess what? He does. Now all I want for my children and for me is to know Jesus more and for us to remain faithful to Him until the end. Yes, let's keep encouraging each other to remain faithful to Him. Next, we've got an email. This is from a listener in Ontario, Canada. Several years ago, I believed I was a Christian through inheritance from my parents. But with your help, I've realized that I have to have my own relationship with Jesus Christ. Each and every day, I'm learning more about what Christianity really is. I want to live my faith so that everyone I meet will want to know Jesus and will ask me questions about him. And then our last note comes to us from a listener of our Swahili programs. My neighbor didn't have a radio, so she came every day to listen to mine. At first, I thought she was wasting her time listening to you, but as time went on, I was attracted to the message of Jesus and began to listen without fail. I'm grateful to know that the only way to heaven is to know God and His Son, Jesus Christ. May God continue to bless you and keep you shining for Jesus, because His glory is here amongst us. You know, let me repeat that. The glory is here amongst us. Isn't that beautiful? Well, if you'd like to continue praising God for His faithfulness in reaching the lost and then celebrate with other listeners as they find their salvation in Jesus Christ, then you need to join our world prayer team today. You can sign up at ttb.org forward slash pray, and then we'll just send you a daily email with specific prayer prompts and then terrific stories of God's goodness in the lives of listeners throughout the world. Again, that's ttb.org forward slash pray, and you need to do it today. Or call us at 1-800-65-BIBLE if you've got any questions. Now let's pray for one another as we study His Word. Heavenly Father, 
Bless us today as we gather and commit this time to you. And as we learn, help us to become more like Jesus. Open our hearts and quiet our minds from all distractions and give us the ability to focus on you. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. Now here's our study in 1 Peter chapter 4 on Through the Bible with Dr. J. Vernon McGee. Now friends, our study today brings us to 1 Peter, the fourth chapter, verse 5. You turn, if you have your Bible, to 1 Peter, the fourth chapter, verse 5. I want to comment very briefly now upon these verses. Verse 1 of chapter 4 reads, For as much then as Christ hath suffered for us in the flesh, arm yourself likewise with the same mind, for thee that hath suffered in the flesh hath ceased from sin. Now, we have labeled this section here that suffering produces obedience to the will of God. And he makes it very clear here that when life is easy, there is a danger that we drift into a state of just accepting everything as if it is something very special to us. And we do not prize life as we should. We do not value life today. And as a Christian, I wonder what value that you put upon life. Now, suffering will change all of that. Suffering for a child of God, and God permits us to suffer, to keep us from sin, and give us a value of life. I hear so many young people, as I speak around a group, say that they did this or that in order to find a new direction for life. And an ex-hippie told me, said that's the reason he became a hippie, was that he was looking for a new direction in life. And he turned that way. Well, may I say to the Christian today, suffering will give you a new direction to life. And that was the thing that David discovered over in Psalm 66, verse 10. He says, For thou, O God, hast proved us. Thou hast tried us as silver is tried. So God puts us through the test in order that it might draw us to himself and help us to prize life, gives us a new direction and drive for life. And that is the purpose of suffering. Now he goes on in verse 2, that he no longer should live the rest of his time in the flesh to the lusts of man, but to the will of God. Now, we don't take life for granted, but we have suffered, and he'll use suffering to keep us from sin. And now he's beginning to look ahead as he moves out in this particular section here that life is short, for the time past of our life may suffice us who have wrought the will of the Gentiles when we walked in lasciviousness, lust, excess of wine, revelings, carousings, and abominable idolatries. That's verse 3. Now, we are very foolish to spend our lives after we're converted in the things that we did before. In fact, we can't do that. We're now joined to Christ. We're united to Him, if you please. And we can't run with the world to sinning. Now we must live today for God. What a tremendous thing this is. Life is short and time is fleeting. We must recognize that we're going to come up before him someday. Verse 4, in which they think it strange that you run not with them to the same profligacy, speaking evil of you. Now, I worked in a bank as a boy began there when I was 16 years old, and they put me on a teller's cage when I was 17 and promised me that next year I'd be made a junior officer, and I felt like I was popular in the bank. And then I went to a young people's conference, and that's where I made my decision really for Christ, first time I'd ever made it publicly, and that I wanted to study for the ministry, and I came back and resign, yet they let me have a part-time job. They were good to me in that way, but I found out I was no longer the popular boy in that place. I became very unpopular as a Christian. In fact, fellas that I had run with, they ridiculed me, and I guess they did well in doing it because they knew what my life had been before. 
But I want to tell you, that was the hardest decision that I had to make at that particular time. I hope I'm not misunderstood when I tell this little story. In those days, I went to dances. In fact, I was chairman of a dance committee that they had, of all things. Now, I imagine some of you never dreamed that I did that. But as a boy in my teens, I did. And so I thought I'd break off gradually. And so I went over to the dance that night with the idea I would not dance. I'd just stand around in the stag line. And I was standing there, and I felt, frankly, very much out of place. And a fellow in the bank that I had been promoted above him, and he didn't appreciate that, and he didn't care much for me, and especially when I announced I was studying for the ministry. And yet he was an officer, a young fellow, an officer in a church. And he came over to me, and he said, this is an H of a place for a preacher to be. And you know, that's the first time he'd ever told me the truth. I agreed with him. I found out you can't break off gradually and that the world is not going to appreciate you very much when you continue on with them. And I walked out of that place never to walk back in it again. My friend, I don't think you can go on in sin if you're a child of God. You've got the nature of Christ. You're joined to him. He's suffering no more. He suffered down here once but he can help you. He sent the Holy Spirit down to indwell. And we've been baptized in the body of believers, as Peter's pointed out to us. And now, by being filled with the Holy Spirit, we can live for God. And we can't do it in our own strength. And he says here, who shall give an account to him that is ready to judge the living and the dead. Now, the Lord Jesus is going to judge someday. And the believer knows that he's to come up before the judgment seat of Christ. And the Lord's going to judge the world. Well, will he judge believers? He sure will. Not for salvation, because you're already a child he is. But he's not going to let you get by with sin, because he's judging the world for that. And my friend, if God judges Christians today in the world, and he does, he chastises his children, and if he does... The unbeliever better beware. He is warned that he will come up someday for judgment. Now, verse 6, For for this cause was the gospel preached also to them that are dead, that they might be judged according to man in the flesh, but live according to God in the Spirit. Now, God wants the gospel preached to all men. And if they don't hear the gospel and don't respond to the gospel... He makes it very clear that they are already dead in trespasses and sins, and they will be judged as men in the flesh. But if they accept Christ, they can live according to God in the Spirit. And that is the thing the Lord Jesus made very clear. In John 5, 24, he says, Verily, verily, I say unto you, He that heareth my word, believeth on him that sent me, hath everlasting life shall not come into condemnation, but is passed from death unto life. He was in a state, you see, of death. And he further amplified that at the time of the death of Lazarus over in the 11th chapter of John at verse 25. Jesus said unto her, I am the resurrection and the life. He that believeth in me, though he were dead, yet shall he live. And whosoever liveth and believeth in me shall never die. Believest thou this? In other words, you and I are dead in trespasses and sins. And that's what Paul meant in the second chapter of Ephesians when he said, And you hath he quickened who were dead in trespasses and sins. We're spiritually dead. Now, in time past, Paul says, we walked according to the course of the world. And we were fulfilling the lusts of the flesh. Now, that's exactly what Peter is saying here, that the gospel is being preached. And when the gospel is preached, two things happen. Some accept it. And if they accept it, they're going to live for God and live throughout eternity. And the others, they are men that are dead in sins, and they are dead to God throughout eternity. That is, 
no relation to him whatsoever. This is a tremendous statement that he's making here. Now, he moves on down in verse 7, but the end of all things is at hand. That has been true from the day that he went back to heaven. Paul could say that the coming of Christ was imminent, looking for that blessed hope and the glorious appearing. That is the rapture of the church. And he says here, the end of all things is at hand. God's going to bring this world to a standstill one of these days while he judges it. He'll take his own out of the world. There'll be a lot of things to straighten up in the lives of believers. They go before the judgment seat of Christ, not regarding salvation, but regarding rewards, regarding their life that they live for God. That's another reason that we should live for God down here because we are coming up for judgment. He says, be ye therefore sober-minded. And I'm glad that the New Schofield Bible has put that in, sober-minded. Peter uses this expression a great deal. And when he uses it, he means actually, be ye therefore intelligent. Be an intelligent Christian. Now, an intelligent Christian is one that will know the Bible. That is, know it the best he can. I've already made the confession on this program that I marvel at my ignorance of the Word of God. And the more I study it, the more ignorant I become. I see how little I really know about the Word of God. But friends, an intelligent, sober-minded Christian is going to know the Word of God. Be something radically wrong. And not only that, he is to be intelligent in an evil world. The Lord Jesus said, be wise as serpents, harmless as doves. But you better have the wisdom of a serpent today if you don't, another snake around the corner is going to bite you. I can assure you that. Be therefore sober-minded and watch under prayer. In other words, prayer should have that anticipation in it, that expectation in it of the coming of Christ. Oh, our dead prayer meetings today, because we're not looking for him. He's the living Christ. And we ought to talk to him now and we're going to talk to him hereafter, and he's going to talk to us. That's the one I'm not so sure I'm looking forward to. Verse 8, And above all things, have fervent love among yourselves, for love shall cover the multitude of sins. Now, he's talking about our relations as believers today, and you'll find out that that is something the writer of the Proverbs had to say. In Proverbs 10:12. He makes this statement, hatred stirreth up strifes, but love covereth all sins. You see, hatred in a church will stir up strife, and this little clique will be against that little clique, and these will be against somebody else, and that type of thing. But love covereth up all of that. Maybe you don't like the way your pastor combs his hair, and a pastor friend of mine in Texas said that, he had just a lock of hair right on top that always would stand up, and it didn't make any difference how he did it. And he says that actually the choir threatened to quit because they were back of him, and they could see that hair sometime during the sermon come up. And they actually became angry with him because of a lock of hair that stood up like that. And he said, you know, every time I went to Barber, I had him just cut that off because I didn't want to offend the choir, you know. Imagine that type of thing. And that's what Peter's talking about here. Then he says, use hospitality one to another without grudging. And I think hospitality today can be expressed in a different way than actually entertaining in your home. The average minister that's going around in conferences today needs to be alone. If his wife is with him, they need to have a room in a motel where he can study and pray and not in a home where he has to carry on a conversation all the time. And may I say, if you want to extend hospitality to your visiting speaker, take care of his motel bill. Maybe invite him out for dinner, but don't talk his arm off. Verse 10, as every man hath received the gift even so minister the same one to another as good servants of the manifold grace of God. Now, I've been over this before in other books, and I'm not going to develop it here at all, but just to say this, and I'm saying just what Simon Peter is saying, every man hath received the gift. 
Now, the gift means a particular gift. There are many gifts. And Paul has already told us in the body there are many members. And the church is a body, and there are many gifts. Now, I don't know who you are, and I don't know what your gift is, but if you're a child of God, you have some gift. And that gift may be to encourage the Through the Bible radio. And I wish that we had more that had that kind of a gift, by the way. Now he goes on. If any man speak, notice, let him speak as the oracles of God. Now, if you're not speaking the Word of God, we have no business to get in the pulpit. We have no business to say we're teaching the Bible when we're not really teaching it. Now he says, if any man minister, let him do it as of the ability which God giveth. In other words, here's one man, he teaches the Bible one way and another another. And you say, I like this one, I don't like the other. Well, this other man will appeal to somebody that your man doesn't appeal to, by the way. Let him do it as of the ability which God giveth, that God in all things may be glorified through Jesus Christ. In other words, we are to teach the Word of God that God may get glory through Jesus Christ, to whom be praise and dominion forever and ever. Amen. But now he's not through. He's going to continue on. Now he's going to talk about suffering in another area. These people were already now moving into the orbit of the hurricane of persecution that broke out during the reign of Nero. Nero had already begun the persecution of the Christians in Rome and was spreading out through the empire. And he's warning them now that they are moving into that orbit of suffering. And they'll become martyrs. Many of these did. And he's talking to them. You and I may not have to become martyrs. And I trust we won't. But we're going to suffer. Verse 12, Beloved, think it not strange concerning the fiery trial which is to test you as though some strange thing happened unto you. You know, most of us, when something comes to us, we think it's something strange. Nobody else has ever suffered like we've suffered. Well, when I was pastor in Cleburne, Texas, I went on one side of the railroad track to visit a family, and there'd just been a suicide in the family, and went over to minister the Word to them. They were not members of my church. And they said this to me, Dr. McGee, why in the world did this happen to us? No one has ever been called upon to suffer as we are. I left their home, and I crossed the railroad track. It was a place then of about 15,000, and the railroad went through the town, and you better be on the right side. Well, I went over to see the family that is on the wrong side, and they had just had a suicide. And you know what they said to me? Dr. McGee, why should this happen to us? Nobody's ever been called upon to go through anything like this. Well, my friend, I don't know what your problem is, but whatever it is, I can assure you that it's not something strange. Others have gone through it, and you will never be the one that will suffer more than anyone else. Paul the Apostle was chosen. One of the reasons the Lord said, I'm going to show him how great things he must suffer for my name's sake. And Paul's gone the limit, and therefore you won't be going the limit. So don't consider it a strange thing. Now, all of us fall into this fallacy. I know when I got cancer, I could not believe it when the doctor told me what I had. I thought you could have cancer, but I never thought I could have cancer. I thought that cancer was something for somebody else, but not for me. May I say to you, friends, that when this comes to you, this fiery trial, and I want to talk about that fiery trial next time. Until next time, may God richly bless you, my beloved. Well, that's certainly a great teaser for tomorrow's broadcast. I hope that you'll join us as the Bible bus travels further into 1 Peter 4, and we hear more about how to handle the fiery trials of life. Until then, if you'd like to know more about what God's Word says about the subject of suffering, and there's a lot there, then I suggest that Dr. McGee's booklet titled, Why Do God's Children Suffer? 
It's available for free download on our website. That's ttb.org. And while you're there visiting us online, I want to make sure that you know that we offer text and audio versions of God's Word in more than 1,300 languages. This is made possible by a partnership with our friends at Faith Comes by Hearing. It's really an incredible resource. It's available for free, and you can access it from anywhere in the world. And for those of you who prefer to get this information on your mobile device, simply download Bible.is. It's an app, and you can take it with you on the go. To find out more or to get the app, just click on the Bible in Your Language button in the Resources section of ttb.org. And if we can help you find any of these resources or maybe suggest another by Dr. McGee that will deepen your study of God's Word, then just call us at 1-800-65-BIBLE. Well, that's it for today. I'm Steve Schwetz, grateful for your company as we make our way through the Bible. Jesus made it all, all to be my own. Sin had left a crimson stain, be washed in white as snow. Our story on the Bible bus today is just one step in a five-year journey through the entire Word of God. Come along for the ride, and you'll study both the Old Testament and New Testament, discovering God's great redemption story. Is this your story, too?